strange, you know. Jin dobra, by the way. <laughs> it's very nice to be here, and Jin kuya to the organizers for inviting me to address you this morning. It's very strange to stand back there and listen to people talking about you, and you haven't a clue what they're saying about you. So I hope they said good things. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about the world of technology, the world we find ourselves in, the world we're going to enter, the things that are happening already and may happen in the future, and what that means for us as educators. Because as uh, Madam Director rightly said, I don't think she's still here, the future is a little bit like all those doors. We don't know which one yet to walk through. So that's why I said technology is not everything yet. Okay? So let's start with where we are now. This is, we live in this world of connectivity. Okay? This is the number of people in the world. 48% of the global population is connected to the internet. The map shows the blue lines and yellow lines and red lines are the underground cables, the, on, the, the cables that go underneath the sea between continents, transmitting data, the connections. It's interesting to see where the dots are, because the dots are all around the coasts. And as I think our presenter says, you know, ports, port, towns that are ports show the most change. And obviously, the connections come straight into those areas, and that's where all that con connectivity is clustered around the coasts. This are some statistics about the individuals using the internet. This is taken from uh, this year, from some statistics from this year, from, um, uh, let me see, I think it's on the last slide. No, it's not. It's the technological um, measuring of connectivity globally. Interestingly, Europe is the highest. What is more interesting is if you go in further into the granularity of these figures, you'll find countries like Finland and Iceland are the most connected countries in Europe. That's those countries people spend the most time on the internet. And you can see the rise from over the last 10 or 12 years, from less than half up to nearly three quarters or more in Europe of people who are connected. While I've been speaking, I've been speaking to you roughly about a minute, okay? In a minute, these are some of the things that have been happening during the minute I've been talking to you. Okay, how many of you are t tweeting? Is anybody here using Twitter in the audience? Okay, so one person is already tweeting about this presentation. How many of you have heard about Twitch? Twitch is down here at the bottom. Do you know what Twitch is? Because I didn't, I had to look it up. So what Twitch is, it's a video platform for young people that uh, shows manga and uh, video games and superheroes and et cetera, et cetera. So it's aimed at young people between the ages of about 10 and 20. <coughs> Twitch. I had never heard of it. It's Netflix for children, Netflix for young people. So let us ask this question. How does technology affect your life? Do you own a mobile phone? Hands up anybody in the audience who does not own a smartphone. Is there anybody in this audience who does not own a smartphone? No. So you all use, you all have one of these. And what are the things you do on your phone? And we look at some of them in a few minutes. You do lots of different things. You read the news, I'm sure. You send messages. You find out where you're going. You maybe shop and buy things. You certainly maybe buy cinema tickets or, you know, you do lots of things on your phone. But more importantly, you should be asking yourself the question, what information can be learned from the use of your phone about you? Okay, so let's look at this. 
The first big thing in phones is geolocation. You know that when you find, look at Google Maps, it locates your, your position exactly. You're that little blue dot on the map, okay? And you want to go to the Basilica in Gdansk, it will show you the route. And you will see, if you look at your phone, your little blue dot will follow until you reach your destination. That's you. But maybe you have noticed that when you download apps, they ask you, can we share your geolocation? And normally people say yes. Fine, that's fine, but you need to know why they're asking you, and we'll come to that in a minute. Facial recognition. If any of you are, you are you know, lucky enough to own an iPhone X or one of the more advanced Samsung phones, you can now look at it and it will open your phone for you. Less, uh, some, some of them use a thumbprint, some of them use a code, okay? If you take a photograph and you look into your library, now I am an Apple user, so Apple technology has this facility to recognize faces, and if you put in a name, it'll throw up all the photographs of that particular person once you've tagged a name onto a photograph. Facebook does it as well. It uses facial recognition in uploaded photos to, to, to recognize the person. Very advanced technology. Buying online, okay. How many of you use your phone to buy something? Okay. Now, behind all of this, behind the geolocation, behind the um, facial recognition, behind of this, there is an algorithm or a, an activity called personalization. Have you heard about personalization? because personalization will pervade the world of the future. Now, it's, it's basically and has started as a commercial, an, an e-commerce thing, where marketing is trying to make sure that it delivers to you precisely what you want, when you want it, and how you want it. So when they offer you, ask you to, to share your geolocation, and you go online and you look for a restaurant in Gdansk. They already know that you're in Gdansk. They already know whether you're male or female. They already know perhaps your age because you put it in somewhere else. They will know your shopping preferences from other things that you've done online. They know that perhaps you buy more cheese in a month than meat. So in geolocation, in personalization, when you search for a restaurant, they will throw up restaurants that maybe don't serve a lot of meat. They might give you vegetarian options. Uh, they will profile it on your, maybe on your financial data, so they won't give you, you know, the, the ones that cost 300 euro for a meal, but they'll give you the ones that cost 20 euro a meal. So they personalize the information it's sending you, okay? And everything you do on the internet is recorded in some way and is building up a data profile of who and what you are, what you like, what you do, what you like to do in your entertainment time, etc., etc. And this is all used to give you a personalized service. And this personalization is going to pervade everything we do in the future. So, do you read the news online? How many of you buy a newspaper? every day, physical newspaper. Once a week, okay, a few people buy them once a week. If I had asked this question 10 years ago, I guarantee that everybody in the audience would have put up their hand that they buy a newspaper every day. But the pattern of newspaper reading has changed, okay? And this is from two, three years ago now, and I imagine these statistics are already changed. Um, the age grouping, 18 to 24, blue, 25 to 34, whereas most of you are in that age group, I would think, are red, and so on, and so on, and so on. I think I'm green, okay? 
But you will find that people are reading their, line, their, their news online. Some of them use Facebook feeds, some of them use Google, some of them use online newspapers, whatever. But they read the news online. Now, what is interesting here is if you apply personalization to the reading of your news, and they do, then over time, your favorite news feed will begin to show you the only stories in your area of interest, okay? Now, in the traditional reading of news, you could read the entire paper from end to end and be aware of everything. In the personalization of news, we are slowly being, our, our free thought is slowly, can be, I'm not saying it is, can be eroded, and we can be channeled in a particular way in terms of the news we get, all right? So this is, this is an important thing to remember. All of this is driven, <clears throat> all of this technology that we have now is driven by algorithms. And simply put, I'm sure you know what an algorithm is, they're digital codes that rank, they count, they, it tells you there, they teach robots to learn. They automate everything, okay? In the future, you, can, you will go into a hotel, you will be greeted by an artificially intelligent press thing, robot, humanoid robot maybe. They will have your room decorated in the colors you like because they know what colors you like. The music will be the music you like. The TV programs will be the TV programs you like. The news feeds will be the news feeds you like. The food they offer you will be the food you like. This is personalization, and this is all powered by an algorithm. Let me give you an example of how an algorithm might work. This is an amusing example. You might have seen this before. <laughs> Right hand, pick up bread slice. Right hand, pick up bread slice. Put down bread slice on plate. Put down bread slice on plate. Pick up jam jar with left hand. Pick up jam jar with left hand. Unscrew jam jar with right hand. Unscrew jam jar with right hand. Put, the, put down jam jar with left hand. Put down jam jar with left hand. Now put jam, jam lid down with right hand. Okay, you can stop with that. Don't mute. <clears throat> so, what this, what this is showing you is it's a group of children trying to program their teacher to, uh, to make a jam sandwich. Okay? They're trying to write the algorithm for making a jam sandwich. It's not so easy. But yet, these algorithms are now the most powerful things in our world. And we're entering what is, we're, we're now almost, you know, a quarter into the first, this 21st century. We're still talking about 21st century learning. But the future and the fa next phase of 21st century learning is coming to grips with this, the power of these algorithms. We're, we're entering a code-dependent age, all right? Now, this, this group here, the Pew Research Center, it's based in America, they asked a number of experts what they felt, what effect they felt algorithms would have in the future. And they wrote a report about it, and the link is on my previous slide there. And I'm sure the, the, the slides will be made available to you, so you'll be able to look at the links. So, the first thing they said, that algorithms will continue to spread everywhere. Now that we've learned to control algorithms, now we've learned to make them do anything we want, they will go everywhere. They're already everywhere, you know? How many of you have driven up to a set of traffic lights that's red, and as soon as you reach this traffic light, it turns green? That's an algorithm, okay? Somewhere in the background, there's a program that recognizes there's no traffic coming in any direction. It can turn the light green and you can go. That is an algorithm.
Good things lie ahead. They do. Good things do lie ahead because these algorithms can work for our benefit. Of course they can. But there is a but and a negative side as well. Humanity and human judgment can be, may be lost when data and predictive modeling become paramount. Now, predictive modeling is when you use algorithms, a little bit like we saw about the profile of teachers in Ponoramia. So the predictive algorithm there is that they're female of a certain age, of a certain education, who act in a certain way. This predictive modeling will help educators to shape the continuing professional development of the future. Okay, that's predictive modeling and it can be used in many, many different ways. However, be careful, because biases, bias exists in algorithms. Algorithms are written at the moment by human beings, and human beings are not perfect, as we know. They have biases. So often the biases can be written into the algorithms. So, for instance, facial recognition technology that's used in a in a crime prevention scenario, maybe we'll home in on people whose skin is darker than ours, or people who, you know, always search on the internet for alternate ways of doing things or things that we might not consider to be socially acceptable. So facial recognition can hone in on these people, perhaps erroneously, in, in a in a crime prevention situation. Algorithmic divides us. The categorizations of algorithms has the potential to divide us, okay? We can be divided into the haves, the have-nots, the desirable things, the non-desirable things, etc. Unemployment will rise, and I have other slides to underline this for you in the future. But the need grows, and this is for us as educators, the need grows for algorithmic literacy. We have to understand what algorithms do. They have to be transparent, and they have to have somebody overseeing them, controlling them, etc. Why? Because this report says that algorithms optimize everything. And they can make our lives easier, they can save lives, etc. But used in the wrong way, and I'll give you some examples of how they're used in the wrong way, in my opinion, they can create division, chaos, and a dystopian vision of where the future is going. So the future face of the future has two faces, really, all powered by algorithms. The first is artificial intelligence or machine learning. And the second is the Internet of Things. So artificial intelligence is where we teach, we code machines to think and learn by themselves. We use cognitive technology to help them think like we do. And that is already very advanced technology and is already in place. The Internet of Things is where everything is connected, all right? Um, we are already halfway there. We go in. How many of you maybe have a phone that can turn on your central heating from your, from, you know, your office? Before you go home, you can turn on your central heating. Anybody have that device? No? How many of you can listen to your house phone messages at a distance? If somebody rings your house and leaves a message, you get a message on your phone to say somebody's left a message and you can listen to it, okay? Imagine a future home where you walk in and your voice tells you you can ask them to open the blinds, turn on the heat, turn on the music. That technology exists. Adobe have it in a, a thing called Alexa. Apple have it in a thing called Siri. All right, Siri, if you have an Apple phone, is an, is an artificially intelligent robot that will give you information and answers, questions, etc., etc. 
All of this is related to something that those algorithms do very efficiently, and that is they collect big data. So every action that I spoke about earlier on your phone is recorded somewhere. All of that is being collated and analyzed okay, into big data. And from this big data can be done many things. We can predict what's going to happen to a degree. We can, uh, if we find out that people like a certain thing over a certain else, then we can offer that thing to them. One of the driving principles, I think, of the modern world is that everybody should be content, should be happy, should not worry, should have everything they want, when they want it and how they want it. There's no challenge in the living anymore. And all of that is due to big data. Anybody know who this man is? This man is the head of Samsung Electronics, and his name is Yong Son. And last week, he spoke in Lisbon at a big, big conference called the Web Summit, which is a very large conference for um, the, the trade, if you like, the, the, the whole internet trade and the marketing thereof. And in his speech, he said he was worried. And what was he worried about? He was worried about artificial intelligence and data gathering. And he talked about the ethics, what is right, what is wrong. At the moment, all of this is driven by market forces. It's driven there to make sure that the optimum uh, situation is that you buy more of the products you like. Okay, that's the, that's the way it's driven at the moment. But he says, hang on a minute, we need to think a little bit about where we're going with all of this. And the research has to be that we use all this data for the advantage of human beings, not to exploit them, not to make them buy more, but to make their quality of life better, and not to take advantage of us. And this is from the head of one of the largest uh, technological firms in the world. He's worried about ethics. Now, this is a, a difficult slide. He said in his speech, look at the figures, there are 340 trillion, trillion, trillion IP addresses. Now, an IP address is a unique address for any little, little um, device, a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I can't think of it. Anyway, that's in your machine, okay? And these all talk to each other. They all connect. So when you use, and here are some examples here, health tracking. How many of you have a Fitbit? like me, that tells you how your heart beats, how much you sleep, how many steps you do. All this is recorded somewhere, okay? So this is, this is, these are the devices. The devices are all talking to you. Look at the scale, how many trillion there are, and there are only 100 billion stars in the galaxy, and I think this is interesting, only 100 billion neurons in the average human brain. So already we have the capacity to outreach even our own capacities, which is a little bit dangerous. He also talked about bi uh, biobanks, and he calls this sensory pervasion. So all of this is there already, collecting the data about us, and in the future it can tell us about our blood, our car, food, the temperature of home, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it will know where you are and track you all the way. And that can work for good, but it can also work the other way. So why do we need ethics? Why bring up the topic of ethics, which is a philosophical question in a sense, in this world of technology? Because the internet of things can curtail us as well as free us. It can take away our individual choice to a degree. It can dull our critical sense. It can undermine, if used incorrectly, our democracy. And that's what we have to be aware of. 
and machine thinking. And we're now entering an age where machines can think faster than we can. Machines can program themselves beyond the things that we can program them with. So the machines can program, program themselves with programs that we as humans cannot understand because they're far more advanced than we are. And that's the danger. Let me give you two examples. The first one is this robot policing. And this is a sharpshooter developed by that man's company, Yong Son's company. Um, it's a robot sensor. It has a gun. Okay. It has an integrated system that includes surveillance, tracking you, your position, firing, and voice recognition. It can challenge you on the street. If you, if you speak to it, it will troll through its data to see if your voice checks with some known criminal's voice. Okay? It can perhaps shoot you dead, but it can also disable you. It could shoot a taser at you and disable you, give you an electric shock. So this could be the future of policing. Maybe our physical police will disappear, and systems like this could be easily used to control us and contain us. Weapons, and this is the really frightening thing, both the, all the big powers, not just the US and Russia, but all the big powers are working on these weaponized, these drones that can work independently of humans to make the decisions to strike. So they don't need us to press a button. They don't need us to pull a trigger. They can be programmed to make that decision themselves. And I just have a very short video I want to show you. And I'll explain a little bit about the video afterwards. Pilots directed almost 3,000 precision strikes last year. We're super proud of it. Can we go forward a bit? It allows you to separate the bad guys from the good. It's a big deal. But we have it's flying itself. Its processor can react 100 times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. They used to say guns don't kill people. People do. Well, people don't. They get emotional, disobey orders, aim high. Let's watch okay, the you weapons can, you can make... stop it now. Okay. So, he's making a very important point here. The important point he's making is that human beings act with emotion. Machines don't, okay? So we can program things like this, who make judgments and make decisions without any morality behind it, without any ethics behind it, without any emotion behind it. And that's why we have to be cautious. We have to look. Just two more examples of how big data and algorithms are being used in the modern world. The first one comes from China. I don't know if you've heard about this. Where by 2020, um, gathering all the data from your daily interactions, from street cameras, from your phone, from you know, you, the things you look at on the internet, etc., you will get a social credit rating. As a good citizen, or a not so good citizen, okay? And in, by 2020, China hopes to rank every citizen on this social credit rating. 
You can be rewarded or punished according to where you fall on this scale. You can move up and you can move down. If you are caught on camera having a cigarette in an area designated as a place where you don't smoke, this can you know, give you a bad mark. If you skip onto a train without a ticket, this can give you a bad mark, et cetera, et cetera. So like financial credit, your, your move can go up and down. Already, there, ha there are statistics, official government statistics in China, of people who have been refused flights because their credit rating was low, because they, they've been refused the, the, the uh, permission to travel. They can't buy a train ticket to go from A to B because you know, they've skipped the line too often and haven't paid or something. So this is, this is a, a real scenario where all the work we do, all the, the, the data gathering about us can be used for or against us. The other important one is happening in Australia. And Australia are trying to bring in legislation where they can force the phone companies to give you give them in the encrypted data on your phone. At the moment, we're safe because everything on our phone is encrypted to a degree, and nobody can access that. And you might remember that Apple were, they were trying to get Apple in America to, to give their encrypted data. If Australia succeeds in this, then everything we do is open to being investigated. And it's really a test case for the world is. If Australia are, are successful in passing this legislation under the guise of keeping an eye on terrorists, um, it will open the, it'll open the door for them keeping an eye on all of us. However, Europe has, in a sense, foreseen this to a degree. And now we have this GDPR, this General Data Protection Regulation, which has became mandatory in Europe from January of this year. What does that mean? That means that you are given control over your data. You can decide whether you want to share things. You can demand the data that's held on your behalf by various companies. You have the right to be removed from databases. You must be told when a camera is filming you, and you have to agree to it, OK? Because we have cameras everywhere, as you know. At least in Europe, a step has been taken to preserve our personal identity, our privacy, our security. So already, Europe is one step ahead of this. And here I come to the, I guess, to the meat of our, our presentation here, the implication for us as educators. What does it mean for educators? Well, already, you know, big data is being used in education. And when we bring a piece of software into our classroom, the people who have written the code for that piece of software allows information about the people using it to be collected, all right, and communicated. And a lot of this is being used and fed back to policymakers. So, um, for instance, school principals are asked to use this data to make their schools a more efficient, pleasant place to work in. Parents can track their pupils' progress, etc. Policymakers, as we heard this morning, can devise continuing professional development for the future based on the predictive modeling from big data. So big data is already here in education. And it's not always a bad thing either. Like, I, I want to stress that. It's just that we have to be constantly critical and cautious about it. We are in this world of technology transformation. Here are some figures. SEDFOP was mentioned this morning. 80% of the technology used in 10 years from now has not yet been invented. And that technology will be implemented by 80% of people already working. So 
most of you will be working in 10 years' time. The technologies that you may use in your classrooms in 10 years' time has not maybe yet been invented, all right? So that has direct implications for you to be in a situation of continuous professional development. You have, you can't, you know, say, I learned my subject in university five years ago, 10 years ago, and that's it. I don't have to do anything else for the rest of my life. You do. You do, you do, you do, because you have to keep on top of this. 50% of the current jobs worldwide will disappear. 30% in Europe. So that means that either we will have another 30% of different kind of jobs coming online, or if we live in a totally artificially intelligent world, the jobs will be done by machines. So more and more people will be redundant in the work sense. And we have to think about what kind of society do we want? What do we create for people who maybe only work a third of their time? What do we do with them? If you need that nine out of the 10 jobs of the future will require digital skills, and look at the, the statistic underneath, less than half of the EU population lack basic digital skills. Although we saw earlier that 78% of them are connected, they're connected without knowing what they're doing. They don't understand what makes it work, how it works, and how it can manipulate them, in a sense. And this will work, of course, towards a new social divide. The people who can control the digital world and those who can't. The people who work in the digital world and those who don't. So the social divisions, we have the possibility that these social divides will become greater and greater. So it is essential that we have to prepare students for this rapid economic and social change. But not just students, but you as well. You have to get up there and begin to understand and think and see and what can you do to make yourself aware and your students aware of what's happening in the technological world. Digital society and the digital economy are a fact of life. We know that. Innovation uh, the, is conditioned by the level of the digital skills in the population. At the moment, we have a handful of people who are highly skilled, who are, in a sense, controlling what happens for the rest of us. That has to change. And things like hackathons are very important because hackathons get young people thinking about how everything is put together and the implications of it. Basic knowledge of technology is vital for our lives. If we are to protect ourselves, if we are to, to understand how the world is manipulating us, digital skills are essential. But I don't think, personally, that it will be enough to be digitally literate. Like, if I tell you that of all the data in the world that's gathered now, I've been talking about big data, 70% of it has been gathered in the last two years. So 70% of the global data that exists in the world today has been gathered in the last two years, which means 30% has only been gathered since records began. Now, if 70% of big data has been gathered in the last two years, what does that mean for the next 10 years? There is no limit to the amount of data that can be gathered, analyzed, and used. So young people will need, and not only young people, but we, us ourselves, will have to develop a strong sense of resilience. Resilience means being able to absorb change, being able to meet change, to be able to control change to a degree. <clears throat> so it's not enough to be digitally literate, but you also need to be resilient. And this brings me to one of my last points. There are two things that are interesting in the world today, neuroscience and cognitive technology. We've touched on cognitive technology, which is where uh, we can teach machines to think as we do. 
and we have already done that, and they are already smarter than us. So that's a fact. Um, neuroscience is where we try to understand the working of the human brain and how we can educate the brain to, to think differently, to approach problems differently. And this is a science of the future because we can directly control this, interfere with it, and change it to a degree. So maybe we're at the cusp of a, a change in us as humans, where we will become superhumans, where our brains will be interfered with, tweaked, poked, and made to think at levels that they don't think at the moment. Interesting. You think this is the stuff of science fiction, but it's not really. This is my last video I'm going to show you. And this maybe is what your classroom might look like in a few The lesson time. that we taught today uh, was for the students to write a story in their own words that had multiple endings and to program the robot to tell that story, switch the ending based on user input. It was definitely cross disciplines. I saw language arts work. Students were composing, um, checking their own grammar, coming up with complex sentences. Syntax was really um, a big component of that as well and they could carry that over to um, computer programming. So it was really across disciplines between computer engineering and language arts. So, so often people say, oh, robots in the classroom, that has to be a math lesson, that has to be a science lesson. This was a little bit of everything. It was uh, write your own story, uh, write it with your hand, type it, okay. look so, Okay, uh, it goes on, uh, and, but we don't have time to look at it all. The thing is that robots already there. They are using robots with autistic children to teach them how to react to emotion. They are using, there's research in Germany with preschool children using a robot like that, called Now, he's called Now, that robot, to teach preschool children a foreign language. So robots are already there. One, in one of the videos I watched, the presenter made a very telling point. He said, robots are more patient than humans. So ro in, in a situation where you have a child who maybe is a little bit slow to pick up a concept, the robot can repeat it endlessly in different ways until the child actually gets it. Something that the human teacher doesn't have, the, maybe the patience, but the time to do in a class of 30 or whatever. So robots will increasingly be used as teacher assistants in classrooms of the future. So for me, I think education is truly now at a crossroads. And we've been saying this for, you know, it seems as if I've been saying this for 10 years, but I do believe that now more than ever, we are at a crossroads. What are the challenges for us as educators? First one is this one staying up to date. We have to know what technologies are doing, what they're capable of doing, and how maybe we can use them. It doesn't mean we have to know exactly everything about them, but we really have to be aware of them. So we have to be digitally aware. Think when you use your mobile phone in future. Think about whether you want them to geolocate you or not. Think about, you know, is the news I'm getting really the news I want to read? Think. Remain optimistic. It's very easy in this kind of scenario to say the future is all black. It's not. And we have to convey this optimistic uh, sense to our young people as well, because they are the controllers of all of this, of the future. We have to nurture as opposed to teach. And in an ideal world, I'm, I'm in a sense um, negating what I have here, because in an ideal world, I would have sent all of you my presentation two days ago, and now we would be discussing it. You wouldn't be sitting there half asleep listening to me, okay? You would be in a discursive mode with me. We have to create new active learning environments. Who ever said that learning has to be linear? 
We know that when kids go from primary to secondary, they go from this kind of integrated education into subject-based education. Whoever said that was a good way? It's not the way we learn. We don't learn in silos. We have to keep the real in focus. The real world and the virtual world have to be very obviously different. Our young people spend so much time in the virtual world now, they find it sometimes difficult to differentiate what is the real. So we have to get them out of the classroom. We have to get them away from machines for a lot of their time. We have to continue to let them act as children, play, climb, talk to each other, learn from each other in an active, real world. And they have to know the difference between the real and the virtual. And we have to focus on emotional and social intelligence, because that is the most important of all. Because unless we humans can continue to collaborate, to talk, to understand each other, be empathic with each other, machines can't be emotional. Machines are not empathic. Machines have no values other than the ones we program them with. And these are the essences of human beings that have to be retained. And we have to remain inclusive. There has to be a place for everyone in our society. Everyone. If 50% of the jobs will disappear and the employment rate will raise more than it is at the moment, we have to build a society where these people can do things that are useful and regarded, give them status, make them feel important. Um, I don't know, you, you know, the, I, I'll skip this slide because I'm running, I think, a little bit out of sight, but these men have visions of education that's different. So Gata Mitra, you might have heard of, has done some research where children in Africa were given a computer and no instruction and they taught themselves. They taught themselves to read, they taught themselves to manipulate. They, it's a system what they call self-organized learning. So he says young children can teach themselves to a degree. It comes to a point, of course, where they need input from more educated people, like teachers, but not in the traditional lesson type. The other one is Negroponte, he's head of MIT, and edX is a platform of Harvard and uh, Yale universities that offer free courses to anybody. So if you type in edX into your Google search, you can take any of the courses from Harvard or Yale that are free. Here is a proposed model of a future education. I talked about linear education. You know, I go in and I, for 40 minutes I study maths. I, I leave and for 40 minutes I study history and I leave and for 40 minutes I do language. That's linear. This is a proposed uh, curriculum for the future from a, a man in America for uh, secondary schools. And here he's talking about modules. As human beings, we don't think in straight lines. We just do not. But we do can think in modules. Now, this doesn't mean that we're getting rid of all the traditional subjects. Of course, they're not. These are incorporated into these modules. But, for example, storytelling, communication can encompass things like history. Um, he ha we have to know how to read, write, and compute. But maybe we need also to learn how to code. Am I running out of time? Yes, very, yes, okay. <laughs> this Save. is um, Europe, okay, can I just, this is um, my second last slide, okay? Because uh, we don't have time. Yeah. Uh, our uh, <laughs> next lecturers are waiting. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've taken up a lot of your time. Any Doctor Who fans in the audience? Uh -huh. So, this is the March of Machines. In this machine age, humans must prevail, and here we have already evidence that countries in Europe are thinking about the impact of machines in the world. These are the artificial intelligence strategies that the world are putting in place since last year. You will notice that your own country 
has been there since 2017. So already they are thinking. And this is my last slide, okay? Not everything, this is a quote from Einstein, who is the father of a lot of this technology, okay? This is what I say to you. Keep questioning, keep pushing the boundaries, yourselves, but also your students. Be disruptive, be critical. Humans interacting with humans is the key to a better use of technology in the future. We have to continue working with others and a better world for all. And thank you for your listening. And sorry if I went over my time. <laughs>